thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and they tell me that you're pleasing that I never alone. It is on when pod. Eres tú, eres tú, eres tú, soy amado por ti. Es quien soy yo, es quien soy yo, es quien soy yo. Oh, and I see many searching for answers far and wide. But I know that we're just searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know just, just what we need Before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, it is on when by it is do, it is do, it is do, so am I do por ti, it's can so yo, it's can so yo, it's can so yo, cause you are perfect in all of your ways. Lord, you're perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. To us, oh Lord, Jesus, Señor, you're perfect in tu voluntad. You're perfect in tu voluntad. Oh, perfect in tu voluntad para mí. Oh, 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 yes. Oh, thank you for always being the one who's consistent in my life. What you want me, Jesus? No one else can be. You give me love so undeniable. I can hardly speak. It's peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think of his love So undeniable I can, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think of his love so unexplainable, undeniable, I can hardly speak peace, peace, so unexplainable, I can hardly think as you come, deeper still as you come, deeper still as you come. Deeper still into love. Her love, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Lord, that's who I am. It's who I am. Cause you are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're perfect in all of your ways. My cousins would say, Perfecta tu voluntad. That means you're perfect in all of your ways. To You're a good, good father. Yes, you are, Jesus. You're a 
good, good fun. Thank you, Lord, for always loving. Here we are, elevated train and on the south side of Chicago. Uh, it's amazing, when we're on trains like this, we often just think of them as uh, ways to move from one destination to another destination. Uh, we never really think about our actual presence on the train as valuable. But it's amazing to me that that's often how we think about place in general. You know, whether we find ourselves in a neighborhood that you know, we would have never chosen to live in on our own, or like on a college campus where we think we're on that campus just for a season and someday we'll be going somewhere else to actually fulfill our purpose. The truth of the matter is, is wherever you've been placed is where God wants you to begin to change the world today, not someday. And so just like this train, our neighborhoods are not places to pass through. I mean, think about it. The fourth practice of Church Forsaken says that we need to reestablish the value of place. We need to be reminded that wherever we are is where God wants us to be, even if it's only for a moment. But even if it's only for a moment, if it feels like you're on the train, the bottom line is you have to practice presence because we're never just passing through. Right when I came to the States, I was placed in uh, in a high school with other Latin American kids who crossed the border, who, you know, uh, lost people, you know, in the river, in the desert. And I was placed in that community. I was one more of those Mexican mm -hmm. little kids. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I experienced was people telling me, hey, you should, oh, my family, not me, but my family, hey, you should probably find a good high school for him. Uh, where there's a lot of white people <laughs> or or try to find a neighborhood where there's a lot of white people because they're usually the good neighbors with good services right mm. uh, and you you tend to buy into that narrative and and I say oh yeah it makes sense and and I went to a high school where there is a bit more white people <laughs> so that meant it was a good high school right? yeah. Yeah. but it was through the experiences of my friends who crossed the border with the people that I uh, related with uh, that I said, well, this, we have to, this narrative, there's something wrong with this. Um, and that just, you know, transformed my, my vision of saying, well, it, why? Why is it that we have to move, or as you say, we have to leave our hood so we can just do well according to what standard, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, who's setting the standards? And, and, and that's what made me reflect. And I, I guess going back, not to the neighborhoods, you know, but to my people my own people say, I'm going back to work with them. Um, yeah, so, thanks for That's great. This is, yeah. <laughs> the narratives are so different, but so similar, right? Mm -hmm. And like, all facing the same, like, lie that's told us how often do this have to do a, um, an, uh, uh, a, 
a, a thing where I have people write down all the lies that they believed about the place they live mm -hmm. and put them all on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then we got to sit and we got to come up with a truth from the word of God that combats the headline mm -hmm. and cover them up. Because we have so many, like we are in, in, inundated with just lies that we've taken in as truth. Right, and if you if you don't begin to name those and like claim like oh God that is not true I don't ever believe that you're perpetuating your children and the people you hang out with your fellow neighbors and you won't even know it. I talked to the mayor of Chicago in his office and he said you know we're critiquing the gun violence issues and like the fact that policing is the way Chicago keeps investing in gun violence versus like actually violence reduction. Um, and he said, well, what would be your plan? And I said, narrative change. He was like confused, like what? So people are getting shot every day and you want us to tell different stories. Yes. And then I began to explain to him because if you live in a community where the narrative is that it's a place to escape, never a place to invest, then you begin to not care about that place. You throw trash in the ground, you don't care, you vandalize it, who cares? Because if I get a lot of money, I'm out of here anyway. Who cares what this place looks like, right? And then anyone else who lives here, I think the same way about them. Just like nobody cares about me because I live here, nobody cares about you since you live here. So if I take your life, who cares? That's why you go to a neighborhood where everyone takes value in that place and there's no trash on the ground. Because it's not a place to escape. This is my place. I'm going to take care of it. These are my neighbors. We all live in this place and we all have value because we live in this place. I would never hurt or steal or rob from them. See the difference? People ask me, being from Chicago, our main thing that I get all the time, of course, is violence, right? That's all people talk about when they talk to me like nothing else happened in Chicago. But when people ask me, they're really surprised by my answer. My answer to violence is reestablishing the value of place. In my neighborhood, I, I hear this all the time when I'm talking to brothers in the block. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm like, man, how can you take somebody else's life? They're like, man, neither one of our lives really matter. If, if it did, no people would, would care. But nobody cares if our lives get taken. Nobody cares if I throw trash on the ground, don't pick it up. Nobody who cares. As a matter of fact, I know it's not important because if my jump shot gets sweet enough, if I sell enough drugs, if I can make enough rap songs and get big enough, the first thing I'm doing, that's the market success. Yeah. So unless this place becomes a place to invest, not a place to escape, you can't ask people to stop shooting each other. Right. You can't ask people to stop stealing from each other because we don't value each other. Because we don't value the place we in. I think that the church is the same way, mm -hmm. right? We commute in, commute out, right? I'm not even hugely a fan of multicultural churches. Don't shoot me. But I'm not against them. I just don't think we should be trying to manufacture them. We should be trying to manufacture multicultural communities, yes. right. which will lead yeah. to multicultural uh, churches because we are in a place that is like, uh, uh, reflecting the diversity of the community. Sweet. Yes, Sweet. right? Not like, hey, we're trying to build a multicultural church over here. Will you leave your community where you are so we can have some diversity in our church? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't even have to say the word multicultural church. We should have community churches. And when you walk in, they reflect the diversity of the community. Right? So my, my neighborhood is almost all black. So my church should be black. Right? But we have a growing Latino population, so guess what? Mm -hmm. Now it needs to look different. Leadership questions have to be asked. Stylistic questions have to be asked. Solidarity questions have to be asked. How do you stand in justice and stand with people who are dealing with different justice issues but that are still dealing with justice issues the same? I want you to recognize that this notion was the first one that me and God had a fight about. I, I didn't like residing. I didn't like, you know, like, oh, okay, I had issues. But this one was a fight. He said, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. What's implied here? Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. To who? My daughters? To brothers from Inglewood? I looked at God and said, have you looked out your window? Have you seen the crop of guys you're telling me? Are you serious? Pants down to their knees, standing on the corner in front of the, 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 the liquor store. Like, that's who, what? Oh, I was like, nah. Sorry, God. I preached the first few verses. This ain't going. I mean, we had a full out problem. 
I went to my wife, because that's what you do when you don't know. I went to her and I said, I'm having trouble with this passage. And she kind of looked at me with that, you know, only way an African-American woman can look at you when she's disgusted. She was just like. And then she says, Jonathan, let me remind you that you are from Inglewood. And there was a time when my father was looking out his window and seeing you with your big baggy pants, book bag, and big headphones on, listening to Wu-Tang Clan going, really, God? Then it, like, clicked even more. I was like, oh, my goodness. If I am going to marry my daughters off to brothers from Inglewood, if I'm going to increase there, then I need to be maybe a little more aware or a little more involved in the creation of good brothers for them to choose. Maybe I should get out of my window talking about them and get on the corner and talk to them. God wants you to create a generational love for your community so much so that you care about the way community will be 30 years from now because your children will still be there and your grandchildren will be there. And if you begin to think about your neighborhood in that way, then it's not just about your food pantry tomorrow. It's about how will this impact my community 30 years from now.